Welcome back to the Deep Discog Dive. It's my favorite time of year when I break free of societal confines and talk about music that people hate. When I'm thrown in jail, I hope the crime that people remember me for is speaking my truth, and not the arson. Who am I talking about today? I, I actually don't know yet. Um, let's go looking for inspiration in my Instagram DMs. Um, oh, whoa, Adam Levine DM'd me. Let's see why. <laughs> Well, on the bright side, Adam's next kid is going to be named Deep Discog Dive Levine. Today, we're talking about Maroon 5. Let's dive in. Jesse just died. We begin this story at the Brentwood School in Los Angeles. Four students in the mid-90s decided to start a band. Adam Levine, Jesse Carmichael, Mickey Madden, and Ryan Dusick. Their first gig was at the Whiskey A Go Go in 1995. After a few more gigs, they were discovered by producer Tommy Allen and songwriter John D. Nicola. You might know the latter as the guy who wrote I've Had the Time of My Life from Dirty Dancing. These high school boys recorded an entire album with the duo, and it got them signed by Reprise Records, though they did end up re-recording this album with a new producer. And so, we got their instant classic, the official debut studio album by Kara's Flowers. In August 1997, Kara's Flowers released The Fourth World. Oh, sorry, were you expecting the first album by Maroon 5? Come on, they couldn't be Maroon 5 yet. There was only four of them. It's not like you'd confuse them for Maroon 5 either. Kara's Flowers had put out one self-released album in 1995 called we like digging? And it's a grunge record of all things! Take a second to ponder the alternate universe where Adam Levine was Kurt Cobain, and then weep for the angel that just died by your impure thoughts. That album is available to listen to on YouTube if you want, but you don't, you don't, you don't have to. You, you really don't. The Fourth World, on the other hand, is more standard 90s alternative rock. It was even produced by Rob Cavallo, most famous for his work on Green Day's biggest albums. But The Fourth World isn't as rowdy as Welcome to Paradise or Basket Case. It's definitely more polished and pop-friendly. Adam and Jesse are the only credited songwriters on here, and already they were showing a good knack for writing catchy tracks. Future Kid and Pantry Queen deliver great dynamic contrast. Soap Disco and myself are lean, mean Adam Levine machines that could fit well on 90s rock radio. My Ocean Blue starts like a cute acoustic ditty and ends with a rippin' blue solo. Me, my darling Jane. Huh, well, a song about Jane. They should do more of those. The band also makes room for solid string arrangements on the Never Saga, To Her With Love, and the grand finale that is Captain Splendid. While I did enjoy my fourth world listens, I would not say this is some long lost classic. It is a good album, perfunctory even. Any less than positive feelings I have about it are more due to ambivalence. I've heard this sound done before and done with more pizzazz. I've even heard it done better by the other bands that Rob Cavallo's produced for. Though if there is one solid thing holding this album back, it's Adam's voice. Now, Adam Levine's got a good voice on him, which will be made clear in the future, but I don't think his upper register works for this style of music. His voice just sounds too clean for my taste. Look, it's fine. The Fourth World is a totally fine rock album, but I'm not gonna pretend like we'd be remembering it if these guys didn't go on to make Animals Moles. Had their story ended here, you would find this album in a record store's 99 cent CD bin sandwiched between 20 copies of Be Here Now. And the general public of 1999 agreed because this album flopped. The Fourth World only sold 5,000 copies. Maybe it was due to the band's sound not doing enough to stand out in the rock world. Or maybe it was the fact that the lead single was called Soap Disco. Oh yeah, the lead single was called Soap Disco. Six months after the album, Cars Flowers got dropped by Reprise. Their last official release was Yesterday When I Was Handsome. What's interesting about this song is that it was the band's contribution to a tribute album for the late Michael and Carly Allen. If those names sound familiar, it's because they were the heads of the Weezer fan club during the Blue and Pinkerton days. I curse God for creating so few degrees of separation between Maroon 5 and Weezer. The withering of Kara's flowers happened just as the band was about to go off to college. Ryan and Mickey went to UCLA, and Adam and Jesse traveled to Long Island to study at Five Towns College. While at Five Towns, Adam and Jesse started to be inspired by the urban sound of the East Coast. They would later cite Aaliyah's Are You That Somebody as a guiding influence on their later music. I don't see it, purely because they have yet to make a song sampling a baby's coup. 
<laughs> the boys reunited on the West Coast in 2001 with the intent of getting back into music, but moving away from their alt-rock past. They recorded demos with producer Tim Somer and shopped them around, with most labels rejecting it. Eventually, they hooked the label Octone Records. They were fans of the demos, one song in particular that I'll touch on later. Octone execs flew out to see Kara's Flowers perform, which sealed the deal for them. Kara's Flowers was once again on a label but not without some changes. For one, they thought Adam had a lot of potential as a frontman, so they pushed to bring in a fifth member so Adam could focus solely on vocals. They also recommended a name change to help distance the band from their alt-rock roots. The band agreed to both changes. James Valentine joined as the new guitarist, and they settled on the name Maroon 5. No one from the band has ever said exactly where the name came from, with Adam even saying he would never reveal it due to how horrendous the origin story is. And here I was thinking it was Adam's favorite color and the number of guys in the band. Regardless, Maroon 5 was a five-person band now and there was nothing we could do about it. Maroon 5 set up shop at Rumbo Recorders with producer Matt Wallace, most well known for producing the big Faith No More records. Adam and Jesse once again did the bulk of the songwriting, with Adam writing many of the lyrics about an ex-girlfriend named Jane. Oh what, you think you could pick a better name? In June 2002, Maroon 5 made their debut with songs about Jane. And man, when you think of fondly remembered albums from the 2000s, this one is definitely up there. So many people speak so highly of this. They consider it a 2000s classic of pop rock and R&B. And allow me to raise my voice with that crowd and say... Really? Okay, look, musical opinion is subjective, it is valid if you love this album, so on and so forth. But like, I, I can't help but feel like the retrospective reappraisal of this album is some kind of Stockholm Syndrome, considering what Maroon 5 eventually turned into. But look, guys, in the grand scheme of things, Maroon 5 becoming what they are today is not that bad. When we as a species are tried for our crimes in the kingdom of heaven, God will probably focus on the Atom Bomb and Ticketmaster way before he even gets to Maroon 5. In my opinion, Songs About Jane is not a classic. What it is, though, is a solid album carried by some great singles. The chemistry between the band first seen on The Fourth World is still there, and they do well adapting that chemistry to this new soulful pop sound. Plus, Adam's voice fits much better here than it did on The Fourth World, and his lyrics have grown to fit Maroon 5's early worldview on relationships, their credo, if you will, which boil down to, My partner is a vindictive abuser. We are in a deeply unhealthy relationship that makes us both worse as people. But the sex is just so good! That worldview is best shown on the album's biggest song, This Love. I don't even know if I can be unbiased with this song. The amount of times I heard it on 95.5 The River in the early 2000s is countless. Thankfully though, I'm not entirely sick of it yet. It's still got a great groove and a hell of an earworm hook. Speaking of insane airplay, She Will Be Loved. It's a song about caring for someone who's trapped in an abusive relationship, a meaning that is emphasized by the music video. Though I don't entirely get why Adam Levine is cheating on his girlfriend with her abused mom, and why it's also The White Lotus Season 2. I'm, I'm confused there. Harder to Breathe is a great opening track, still might be the most aggressive thing Maroon 5 has made to this day, with Adam's sneering, vindictive performance selling the hell out of it. Same deal with Not Coming Home, as Adam finally puts his foot down and leaves an abusive partner. Not Coming Home is the best deep cut on here, in my opinion. The rest are fine, with other highlights being Shiver, Must Get Out, and The Closer Sweetest Goodbye. Also, shout out to The Sun, a song where Adam questions the difficulties of life to his mom, and she responds as if the sun will soon consume them all. Adam's mom and Gerard Way's dad would be great together. There's one more song about Jane I want to bring up. Sunday Morning. I know we're still early in Maroon 5's life, but th this is their best song. Maybe Remember when I said the Octone executives were really impressed by one Maroon 5 demo in particular? That was Sunday Morning. In contrast with most of the record, Sunday Morning is just a really sweet song about wanting to be back with the person you love. It's a simple idea with a great composition and great performances. Love it. Songs About Jane may not be a stone-cold classic in my opinion, but it is still deserving of a positive reputation. If nothing else, it's the only Maroon 5 album to have this scrappy upstart spirit to it. Maroon 5 was just some band who made a pretty good album. Songs About Jane was 
Not a big success at first. Reviews ranged from positive to lukewarm, and sales were modest at best. But it started getting more attention thanks to radio play, consistent touring, and knowing the right people. Around this time, a college friend of James Valentine's was getting his own big break, and he invited Maroon 5 to join him on tour in 2003. They also joined tours for tons of other artists, like Michelle Branch, Sugar Ray, The Hives, Counting Crows, and even the Rolling Stones. Wow, that Mick Jagger sure has some moves, doesn't he? The turning point for Maroon 5 came in 2004. All their hard work paid off as Songs About Jane hit its peak at number 6 on the Billboard Top 200. It went on to be one of the biggest albums of that entire year, netting four songs in the top half of the Hot 100 and earning the band a Grammy for Best New Artist. The band's first release in a post-Songs About Jane world was in July 2005, a cover of Sly and the Family Stone's Everyday People for a cover-slash-remix album. That same year, Adam Levine also started doing collabs with other artists on his own. For example, no way, uh, and I I heard him say, nothing's ever promised tomorrow today. I am still baffled at how this song exists. Like, I'm gonna have to explain this to my kids one day. Don't get me wrong, Heard Him Say from Kanye West's Late Registration is a great track. What I always get hung up on though is, I just don't think this song could have happened at any other point in history. It sure couldn't happen now, with Adam Levine fighting for his life in the DMs, and Kanye September 2005 saw the release of their first live album, Live Friday the 13th. 2006 saw only one release by the band, a Cuban rendition of She Will Be Loved with Rhythms del Mundo. This is super neat on the surface, but after listening, I'm almost positive it's the exact same vocal track with a new arrangement. But somehow, that wasn't the biggest development for the band this year. You see, because of their constant touring, Ryan Dusick started to have an old sports injury of his flare up. And in September 2006, he left the band for the sake of his own health. The remaining members quickly brought in Matt Flynn as a replacement. Don't worry though, Ryan was given the credit of musical director on the band's second album. Alright, they've got to make a second album. Maroon 5 recorded their sophomore record in multiple California studios and with multiple producers like Mark Stent, Mark Enders, and Mike Elizondo. You might recognize Mike as a producer for Eminem and Dr. Dre, and regular viewers of the Deep Discog Dive will know him as the producer for Fiona Apple's extraordinary machine. These degrees of separation are pissing me off. Maroon 5 released their second album in May 2007, It Won't Be Soon Before Long. And there's two sides to this album-shaped coin. The first side is where Maroon 5 takes the soul of Jane and pushes it further into funk. For example, Makes Me Wonder, which... Okay, maybe this is the best song Maroon 5 has ever made? I know I said this many minutes ago that Sunday Morning is Maroon 5's best song, and like most statements I make this many minutes ago, I stand by it. But Makes Me Wonder is not only a close second, but it's more representative of the band's sound. Adam crooning about his lost faith in a relationship with one of the best melodies they've ever written. It also happens to be, and I, and I didn't know this until doing research into the band, but this song is, and I'm not making this up, I am not reading into it too much, this comes directly from Adam Levine himself. Makes Me Wonder is apparently a subtle protest of the Iraq War. Apparently Adam wrote it as he was losing faith in his own country, but frankly there's no way you're gonna pick up on that just from the song. It's like if Steve Lacey wrote Bad Habit about Jet Force Gemini, and you could only tell because he says Gemini in it. Other standouts in this same funky vein include the opener If I Never See Your Face Again and Kiwi. But on the other side of the coin, Maroon 5 reel back from Soul and go in a softer, ballad-focused direction. A lot of these songs seem to be modeled after She Will Be Loved, so much so that they veer right into adult contemporary. It's like the band saw Snow Patrol and Coldplay during the mid-2000s and decided to mine for gold there. Truth be told, this isn't really where Maroon 5 is strongest, in my opinion. Though not every one of these softer tracks are bad. I do enjoy Nothing Lasts Forever, especially its familiar chorus. Distance between us makes it so hard to stay. I also enjoy the single Won't Go Home Without You. I think that gets the closest to nailing the appeal of She Will Be Loved. I should also mention that this coin has a third side, which is just a gun. Because we've got, in my opinion, the first all-out clunker in Maroon 5's catalog. Wake Up Call. The songwriting is okay, but the performances feel too laid back for a song about shooting a man who's having an affair with your girlfriend. 
Adam's lyrics and delivery do not help either. Adam Levine is scorned lover? I can buy. Adam as emotionally charged murderer? Absolutely not. It Won't Be Soon Before Long is one step forward, one step back for Maroon 5. There are good songs worth checking out on here, but this is probably the weakest early Maroon 5 album. Despite the album's title, it was not long before this new album became a success. It debuted at number one on the Billboard Top 200, and Makes Me Wonder became the band's first number one hit. The year after Soon Before Long, as Maroon 5 were touring the world, we got a re-recorded version of If I Never See Your Face Again with Rihanna. Nice. It was also during this tour that the band started writing their third album. Maroon 5 shipped out to Vevey, Switzerland for two months of recording. Only one producer this time, though, Robert John Mutt Lang, most well known for ACDC's Back in Black and Shania Twain's Come On Over. In September 2010, we got Hands All Over. Things kick off with lead single, Misery, which is still one of their best songs. It feels like the 2010 pop update of This Love. Misery also has a great video, a tongue-in-cheek romp as Adam Levine gets the crap beaten out of him by a supermodel. I always get a kick out of this bit where she stabs his hand and he's just like... I feel like thinking about something, but I don't know what. While we're on the topic of good songs, the second track, Give a Little More, is good. Screw that, actually. It's great. Killer groove from the band, great vocals by Adam. My god. Are we in for a great album? There are plenty of highlights here. The aforementioned funk of Give a Little More, the sick breakdown on Get Back in My Life, the Motown-inspired throwbacks of Don't Know Nothing and I Can't Lie, the soaring balladry of Never Gonna Leave This Bed, the sweet closer out of goodbyes with Lady formerly known as Antebellum. If there's any time when the album falters, it's when it tries its hand at overblown stadium rock on Stutter and the title track. They just, they feel forced to me. Also, what is this comic book effect on Hands All Over's music video? Weird. Anyway, aside from those two songs, I think Hands All Over is their best album. Sure, songs about Jane made their career and it has the underdog spirit, but Hands feels like the best possible intersection of Maroon 5's soul and pop music at large. But even with the attempts at updating their sound, Hands All Over was the first Maroon 5 record to commercially underperform. It did debut at number two on the Billboard Top 200, but with sales equaling a third of Soon Before Long. And the singles were not, not hits, but nothing got in the top 10 of the Hot 100. In fact, so far, Maroon 5's journey is reminding me of The Strokes. Yeah, 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 hear me out on this. First album establishes a winning sound and catapults the band to major success in their respective genre. Second album retreads that sound while adding enough new tweaks to stay fresh. Third album tries to modernize their sound and gain a bigger audience, but underperforms. Of course, there is one major difference that is about to come into play. The closest The Strokes got to any sort of hit song with their third album was Juicebox, and even then it only got to 98 on the Hot 100. Maroon 5, on the other hand, took a different path. Like I said, Hands All Over didn't sell as well as Soon Before Long, and reports suggested that this underperformance spooked the band. They had big expectations for the third album, and those expectations were just not met. The third is, is when it's like not a fluke. You know, if the third record does really well, and, and the third record, you know, people want your songs on the radio and they want, you know, you're part of the culture still, I think your third record makes it officially not a fluke, you know? We've had a really good run, and hopefully it'll continue forever, but, uh, you know, the third record does kind of permanently mark you in a weird way. It's, at least that's how I feel. It really seemed like they were considering calling it quits after this, but they didn't. They did something else. Now, I am about to commit a truly heinous act. I am going to play devil's advocate for Maroon 5 selling out. First off, selling out is a dumb phrase and I don't like using it. I don't fault any artist for recognizing they have something good on their hands and wanting to get that out to as many people as possible. But I also get concerns about how an artist might start valuing numerical or financial metrics over artistic integrity. Following hands all over, Maroon 5 wanted a hit. They just wanted a hit. And in order to make it happen, for the first time in their career, they brought in two outside songwriters. Ben Blanco and Shellback. Now, I think bringing in outside songwriters has a negative stigma. Many times when people complain about a pop song they don't like, they point to how many writers it had. There's this idea that an artist's vision is purest when unencumbered by any other force, and bringing in more people to realize it is a sign of corruption. And sure, there are examples that support that viewpoint, like um, uh, Weezer's Ratitude, but there are also times when it works well. 
Taylor Swift would soon be doing it in a few years, and that record is one of her best. Granted, Maroon 5 could have stuck to their guns and continued to release soul and funk-influenced pop, but like, let's be real with the benefit of hindsight, Maroon 5 circa 2010 was not long for this world, you know? Consider what pop music sounded like at the turn of the decade. It was club anthems, EDM, songs about partying like there was no tomorrow. Maroon 5 didn't make music like that. Were we expecting them to keep doing the same thing with rapidly diminishing results? By the end of the 2010s, they would have either broken up or been relegated to the realm of bands like The Fray, or Daughtry, or Plain White Tees. And sure, we may have plenty of negative things to say about Maroon 5 today, but when's the last time you had anything at all to say about The Fray, or Daughtry, or Plain White Tees? My point is, on the surface, Maroon 5 did something that many great bands did before them. They adapted with the times. So what did they make? On June 21st, 2011, Maroon 5 released Moves Like Jagger. The big narrative about this song is how much of a turning point it was for Maroon 5. When most bands change their sound, it usually takes a few albums, a long break, a major member leaving or joining, but Maroon 5 were one thing, Moves Like Jagger came out, and then they were something else. When it comes to its overall production, yeah, I can see where people are coming from with that. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized it's not actually that far out from what the band was doing around this time. What's really different here? The percussion sounds more forceful, the whistle hook is a new touch for the band, the overall production comes off as more synthetic. Oh, wait a second, it's the filter effect. Oh, that's why everyone thought they sold out. But considering we just came off songs like Hands All Over and Get Back In My Life, I don't think this sticks out too much. However, I think the area that has seen the most visible shift is the lyrics. Now, older Maroon 5 lyrics were not going to win Pulitzers, but they had a singular energy to them as defined by the Maroon 5 credo. Moves Like Jagger has some very dumb lyrics that do not make sense if you stop to listen. At best, it doesn't matter and you can just have fun singing along to them. At worst, they make you feel like the writers are trying to just put in words to meet a quota. This phenomenon actually makes a bit of sense though. Shellback happens to be a protege of songwriter Supreme Max Martin, who also has a noted history of lyrics that are fun to sing but questionably not nonsensical. Why are the first words shoot for the stars if it feels right and aim for my heart? What is Adam Levine implying about the location of his heart in relation to outer space? There's also the fact that this came out during that one time in history when every songwriter just needed to mention Mick Jagger. All these girls they like my swagger they call it me Mick Jagger. Swagger Unless they look like Mick Jagger. Bonus points to Maroon 5 for not rhyming Jagger with swagger, though. Oh, also, Christina Aguilera is on here. She's fine, but she also gets her own questionably dumb lyrics. What is the secret that you have to hide, Christina? Is it that you too have the moves like Jagger? At this rate, the moves like Jagger will infect the entire country. Jokes aside though, Moves Like Jagger is a perfectly fine pop song. Adam would later say that Moves Like Jagger revived Maroon 5. I suppose we'll find out soon if that's a good thing. Following moves like Jagger's immediate success, July 2011 saw a re-release of Hands All Over with MLJ added on. This alone got Hands All Over back to the top of the charts. Maroon 5 was popular yet again, but at a heightened level never seen before by the band. It was good timing too. Their profile also rose that year due to Adam Levine's guest spot on Gym Class Heroes' Stereo Hearts. And on top of that, Adam became a judge on the all-new singing competition show, The Voice. I know it's a bit of a meme these days, but 2011 really was the turning point when Adam Levine became a separate entity from Maroon 5. In January 2012, James Valentine released an album with Jams, a collection of session musicians from other bands. He would later leave, and the band would rename itself as Phases. Speaking of band members leaving, in March 2012, Jesse Carmichael announced a break from the band. In his place, PJ Morton got promoted from touring keys player to 
full-time member. Also, let me take a second to say, PJ Morton has a whole bunch of records to his name outside of Maroon 5, and they're packed with great soul and gospel music. Seriously, if you only take away one thing from this entire video, let it be that PJ Morton's solo stuff is worth checking out. Jesse's absence meant that Maroon 5's fourth album would be the first not to feature him. But fret not, because along with PJ, the band got help from every big producer and songwriter in 2012. Max Martin is executive producer, Shellback, Benny Blanco, Ryan Tedder, j j j j j r Rodham, Damon Albarn. Wait, Damon Albarn wrote a Maroon 5 song? Why, what, what? <laughs> Okay, so there's a bonus track called Wipe Your Eyes. It samples a song by a Malian duo named Amadou and Mariam, and that song was co-written by Damon Albarn. So yes, the man who made Feel Good Inc. and Clint Eastwood is technically a writer on a Maroon 5 song. The leading mantra for this album seemed to be, let's try to make moves like Jagger 10 times in a row. The band exposed themselves to new collaborators, though one might say they became overexposed. The missile knows where it is at all times. In June 2012, Maroon 5 released Overexposed. The songs this time are of course coded with early 2010s pop production, but I'm willing to say that some of these songs still have that maroon shade. Payphone, for example, was the lead single, and it continues the trend of Maroon 5 songs about failing relationships. I even like how it uses the metaphor of a payphone to signify how this relationship has become antiquated. Wiz Khalifa, what do you think of this situation? Man, Thank you, Wiz, I love you. One More Night is another reflection of the Maroon 5 credo, and it's also the biggest song on the record, getting to number one on the Hot 100. I also get to bring up a favorite bit of trivia. One More Night being number one in late summer 2012 meant that it kept size Gangnam Style from reaching number one. That's right, this one Maroon 5 song you haven't heard in years technically made more of an impact on popular culture than Gangnam Style. Daylight is fine, okay, inoffensive, even. Love Somebody is... Okay, I can't do it for this one. I don't like this song. Maybe there are worse songs in Maroon 5's catalog, but god, none of them annoy me as much as this one. I swear, every lyrical cliche possible is in here somewhere. There is not a single original line. Oh, this girl takes you all the way there, Adam? Where does she take you? An in and out off of Route 1? The deep cuts are a mixed bag. Lucky Strike and The Man Who Never Lied with their millennial whoop choruses. God, remember when people thought wordless chorus hooks were ruining pop music? Lady Killer and Doin' Dirt are the closest things production-wise to past Maroon 5's soul pop. Sad is just... sad. Man, this thing is all over the place. Any semblance of coherency from past albums is sacrificed in the name of chart domination. Some good songs for sure, but not worth a front-to-back listen. So did Maroon 5 get 10 more moves like Jagger? No, but 4 out of 10 isn't terrible. All four of the singles off Overexposed landed in the top 10 of the Hot 100, and the album as a whole sold damn well. Reviews were mixed for sure though, with several critics lambasting this blatant attempt to go pop. But still, Maroon 5 were on top of the world. In October 2012, Adam scored his first TV role in American Horror Story Asylum. This was your chance to see Adam get brutally murdered. That same month, Jesse announced he would return after the tour for Overexposed, and with PJ staying, that meant Maroon 5 were no longer five guys. It's okay, it's fine. I'm already over it. In April 2013, Adam wrote a song with Ludwig Jorensen for the puppet episode of Community. This doesn't really have any bearing on anything to come, I just think it's very funny that Adam Levine had anything to do with Community. About a year later, Maroon 5 left Octone and joined Interscope. The puppet song must have been the last straw for somebody. In June 2014, Adam Levine landed another big acting role, this time in the film Begin Again. And look, I know we all like to rag on Adam Levine, but being real here, he is pretty good in this movie. He plays this hotshot musician who cheats on Kira Knightley. The movie itself is good too, it's a nice uplifting story about finding yourself through music. Adam even sang a song for it called Lost Stars, and I have no issue calling this a great song. And if you don't feel comfortable saying that about a song sung by Adam Levine, you should also know that it was written by the frontman of the New Radicals, so you can focus on that bit if you want. It's also Adam's first song as a solo artist, unless you count his past collabs or the duets from The Voice. We got Maroon 5's fifth album, Five, in August 2014. According to the band, the aim this time was to make an album, a real album's album, one that wasn't afraid to go darker and to revisit the band's roots. Maps was the first single, and honestly, I don't think this one is half bad. A decent attempt at classic Maroon 5 subject matter. I like that little drumline bit right before the second half of the chorus. That said, I find it very jarring how on the chorus, Adam says following like this. 
The emphasis on following is so annoying. I also don't get how the music video is supposed to relate to the song. The song is about a partner who doesn't do enough in the relationship. The video is Adam kissing a girl at a party, his girlfriend seeing it and getting mad, her running out and getting hit by a car, and Adam seeing her die in a hospital. Also, it's structured like Memento. As I'm editing this, I am now realizing that in the video, Adam is the partner who isn't doing enough. Is Maroon 5 being self-critical right now? That that feels like a, a big deal. Sugar was the third single and the album's biggest hit. I, I can't hate on this too much. It's basic, it's fun, it'll be on wedding playlists for the foreseeable future. No harm, no foul. Shout out to the music video, which is structured like a YouTube challenge video. It even inspired a YouTube original series that was itself a set of public challenge videos. I also do like This Summer. It it's dumb synth pop, but I think it knows that it's dumb and I'm down for that. I also think Adam uses his falsetto well, especially on the pre-chorus. She really thinks that she can move the maliciousness where Adam doesn't use his falsetto well is Feelings. The production sounds like an underrated Jamiroquai track, and then Adam shoots his falsetto straight into you like a giant spike. And while we're holding that particular note, animals. The gumption? The audacity? The tenacity? God is dead and Adam Levine's auto-tuned howl killed him. Listen guys, we don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. I just hope that whatever you were going through at this time that was causing you pain isn't hurting you anymore. Five is definitely more cohesive than Overexposed, but I think it also loses some of that album's more memorable moments. There's a bunch of deep cuts on Five that I haven't mentioned, but that's really because I don't have a lot to say about them. The highs this time aren't as high, and the lows are actually quite high. Maroon 5 were once again, as the stockbrokers would say, very successful. Five debuted at number one on the Billboard album charts, their first album to do so since 2007. Though once again, critical reception was very mixed. Only a few minor things between albums this time. Adam sang the chorus for Our City's Locked Away in June 2015. September of that same year saw the release of Singles, their first greatest hits album. An admirable collection, but an invalid one since Sunday Morning isn't on it. Catch me with the boys Sunday Morning, if you know what I mean. In 2016, good friend of the band and Phantom Planet bassist Sam Ferrer was confirmed as an official member, meaning Maroon 5 was now a seven-piece. <laughs> the new era of Maroon 5 kicked off in October 2016 with their single, Don't Wanna Know. I don't wanna know, no, 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 who's taking you home, oh, oh, oh. Wow, this song stinks. I've tried to see the positive in all things Maroon 5 so far, but man, this is probably their worst lead single. A tropical house track with an uninterested performance by Adam, all wrapped up in a Pokemon Go parody video. Adam blows a guy up with his psychic bug powers, what the hell? Not even a verse by Kendrick Lamar can save it. The man who made the Bad Blood remix passable couldn't escape Adam Levine. The second single, Cold, dropped in February 2017. This one's better but I wouldn't call it good. Future's on it. He's fine. But surprisingly, slash thankfully, neither of those songs were included on the standard version of their next album. In November 2017, Maroon 5 dropped Red Pill Blues. You envy Adam Levine for his rock star life. I envy Adam Levine for not knowing why red pills were relevant in 2017. We are not the same. You might also notice the, um, Snapchat filters on the cover. The band said it was their fun little way of tapping into the zeitgeist. And their tapping doesn't just end at Snapchat filters. Red Pill Blues sees the band venture into trap-influenced pop. This record has features from ASAP Rocky, Lunch Money Lewis, Cardi B, Kendrick and Future if you count the extra lead singles. I know this is a very low bar to clear, but could you imagine if Adam Levine was the one rapping on these songs? Instead, despite everything leading up to it, I didn't hate this. I know, maybe I have a soft spot for this period of pop music, or maybe there just aren't as many low points as past albums. Don't get me wrong though, there are still low points. Why in God's name you would release a song like Lips On You in 2017 of all years is beyond me. But then I remembered that God is dead. I also didn't care for Whiskey, ASAP Rocky feature and all, but the rest of the album is acceptable. And in some instances, okay. You ever compliment something, but it still feels like an insult? What Lovers Do was the first real single, and it's totally fine. Though I I always mishear the chorus like this. Please don't, Adam. SZA is on here, and I am always in favor of SZA being on things. 
Yes, SZA, please hit me with that lay down, baby. Waits' production is by no means original, but it's certainly competent. It's also kind of nice to hear a Maroon 5 song that doesn't bemoan a failed relationship, but actively wishes to prevent it from failing. Again, not saying the lyrics will win awards, but it's a step forward. It also has an interesting, if overactive, music video that jumps between 16 different visual metaphors. Fellas, rule number one of relationships, when you wake up shirtless in a church, don't put the scorpion on Alexander Daddario. Who I Am has a genuinely enjoyable beat behind it. Help Me Out is bolstered by a decent Julia Michaels feature. The real big song, the giganto moneymaker on here, is Girls Like You. While the original album includes this song, it was the version with Cardi B that became a massive hit. Come through, I need a girl like and it's Fine! Look, the song is basic. It might be the most basic song Maroon 5 has made in a while, but basic things often work for a reason. A 1564 chord progression in C major works. Adam Levine singing with the vaguest emotion possible works. The subtle rhythmic dexterity in the chorus works. That said, at no point do I understand what makes a girl like you a girl like you. The only qualifiers given are rolling around with guys like Adam and having fun. You could apply that title to nearly any living organism. In fact, I had never paid much attention to the lyrics here, and some of them are just... Now it's all good, babe. Roll out backward, babe. Let me close. What the hell does that mean? Okay, a backwood is a brand of cigar that's often used to roll joints, so the rolling part makes sense. But play me close is an expression meaning either to trick someone or watch them attentively. So is Adam telling you to trick him out of his weed or to watch him as he rolls it? Maybe he ignored the actual meaning and he's talking about playing his music close, like get high and listen to Maroon 5. Maybe it's a euphemism for sex? It's probably a euphemism for sex, let's move on. The guest verse by Cardi B is fine, but the part that always gets me cracking up is this. I don't play when it comes to my heart, let's get it though. It's such a random interjection that I can't help but laugh at it. As you can see, earnings for Q4 are slightly below projections due to unexpected shifts in consumer behavior. Let's get it though. Also, in the music video, why is Cardi B edited with a bunch of jump cuts, but the background footage stays consistent? It looks like she's breaking out of the simulation. But beyond all of that, the song on Red Pill Blues that is most worthy of attention is actually Closure, an 11 and a half minute song with two thirds of it being an instrumental jam. Honestly, best song on the whole record. Okay, maybe I'm just starved for anything unexpected at this point, but this was genuinely a nice surprise. It's also nice to be reminded that Maroon 5 still fits the legal definition of a band. What I'm realizing at this point in my dive is that Maroon 5 were doing this thing where they were using the sounds of the time too late to be trailblazers, but not too late to come off as totally embarrassing. In another universe, they'd be commended for bringing in new sounds and refusing to stay stagnant. Maybe that's also the universe where Adam raps. For the first time in their career, shortly after Red Pill Blues, Maroon 5 was hit with a genuine tragedy. Their longtime manager, Jordan Feldstein, passed away. This would not only shake the band to its core, but it would also influence their next album. Before that album, though, in early 2019, Maroon 5 played the Super Bowl halftime show with Travis Scott and Big Boy. My expectations are not high for halftime shows these days, and Maroon 5's was as middle of the road as they come. God bless the gospel choir that tried their darndest to put actual meaning into girls like you. Travis Scott was fine doing sicko mode. Big Boy was fine doing the way you move. Hell, you probably don't even remember any of that. You probably just remember this show because they did sweet victory for all of five seconds because the creator of SpongeBob passed away and the internet wanted a tribute to him. Later in 2019, Adam popped up on Lil Dicky's climate change anthem, Earth. He also appeared on a Joe Pesci album. I'll let you decide which one of these did more for climate change. The only big news in 2020 that wasn't they can't tour because everyone collectively stubbed their toe was Mickey Madden leaving the band in June. Oh, did he decide to take a break like Jesse did? What the actual hell? In his place, we got Sam Ferrer taking over official bass duties. The final Maroon 5 single to feature Mickey was Memories. This one is pretty clearly a tribute to their late manager, and regardless of the song's quality, it's a very nice gesture. The song itself is okay if confusing. I still don't fully get the Pachelbel's canon interpolation, and the song never really builds to anything. Frankly, I just prefer the version sung by Peter Griffin. Here's to the ones that we got. Cheers to the wish you were here, but you're not. In May 2021, Maroon 5 released their most recent album as of this video, 
Jordy. Again, the name is clearly in reference to Jordan, and it gives the impression that this album will reckon with the loss of a dear friend and partner. Does that make it a step above their past albums? <laughs> Nah, this thing is rough, I'm sorry guys. I know this was named after a dead friend, but that's no reason to make an album that's so lifeless. The trap pop of the last album is still here, but everything sounds like it's taken an Ambien or 2 or 23. The opener, Beautiful Mistakes, is basically their version of 24K Golden's mood. Why you always in the mood? Press around like I'm brand new. I ain't trying to tell you what to do, but you- I, I mean it, they are the same song. Megan Thee Stallion is on this, but honestly, I would much rather hear Megan call me a bitch and push me off a cliff. In fact, I was starting Starting to really think about this trend of big rappers doing verses for Maroon 5. What is it about this band that makes them a weird rite of passage for any big rapper? My only educated guess is that, since Maroon 5 still gets major radio airplay, folks like Kendrick and Megan see their songs as a way of expanding their audience. The rest of the album varies between weak and confusing. Lost is a middling retread of Wait, Remedy wastes a Stevie Nicks feature, Nobody's Love came out back in 2020, which was a surprise to me because I completely missed it. Also, the last track on the deluxe version is a Jason Derulo song, not a Maroon 5 song with Jason Derulo, a Jason Derulo song featuring Adam Levine. Good. Despite all my negative feelings about Jordy, I do need to mention the positives. Or rather, the positive. There's a song on here called Convince Me Otherwise. It's a collab with her. It's a blatant ripoff of Tame Impala, and it's good. It's not mind-blowing, it's not some new brilliant sound, but it's good to a distressing level. If this inspires Maroon 5 to continue in that sonic direction, or even to collab with Kevin Parker, I I'm sorry in advance for willing that into existence. Jordy is not great. I don't recommend its stagnant blend of trap pop to anyone. At this point, you could probably chart the history and trajectory of pop music from 2010 to now solely through Maroon 5, and I'm not sure if that's a compliment. Now usually I would wrap up this dive by explaining what the band's been up to since their most recent record, and then recommend albums for you to check out. But I'm not satisfied yet. I want answers. I want to definitively figure out why Maroon 5 is still a thing, even though all possible evidence suggests that people don't like them anymore. I'd like to start by bringing up a 2021 quote from Adam that got him into some controversy. He said, Something unique to this band is that we have always looked to hip-hop, R&B, all rhythmic forms of music, from back when we were writing our first album to now. Rock music is nowhere, really. I don't know where it is. If it's around, no one's invited me to the party. All of the innovation and the incredible things happening in music are in hip-hop. It's better than everything else. Hip-hop is weird and avant-garde and flawed and real, and that's why people love it. Now, there's two things I'd like to discuss when it comes to this statement. The first thing is that Adam is kinda right. I'm sorry, had the general public not spent the decade prior bashing the state of rock music? Plus, when he said how the most exciting things in music were coming from hip-hop, I'm not gonna disagree with that. Of course, that doesn't mean that rock music as a whole has been nowhere, it just hasn't been the most popular genre. But when Adam made the statement, I think he was mainly referring to what was right on the surface. Like, one of the biggest people to clap back at Adam was Corey Taylor from Slipknot, and I get his frustration, but... Honestly, do you think Adam Levine pays attention to Slipknot? An even better question, do you think Adam Levine knows what Slipknot is? And, and I, I don't mean that as like some pretentious music snob or anything. Genuinely, when in Adam Levine's life would he need to know what Slipknot is? I, I really can't think of a time. In my opinion, we weren't mad that he said this, we were mad that he said this. The frontman of one of the last big quote-unquote rock bands, and even then calling Maroon 5 a rock band at this point was a huge stretch. But here's the second thing, Maroon 5 is not a rock band. You might say, well, yeah, nowadays they're not. They've totally betrayed their rock beginnings. But no, 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 that's the thing. Maroon 5 has never been a rock band. Adam Levine's first collabs were with Kanye West and the Yin Yang Twins. Adam's main vocal inspiration was Stevie Wonder. Their inspiration starting out were R&B artists. Whenever they do covers, it's usually covers of R&B artists. Just because Maroon 5 is a bunch of dudes with guitars doesn't necessarily make them a rock band, and I think it's that misconception that has embroiled them in so much hate. Though let's be clear, Maroon 5 have not been free of sin themselves. Aside from that one quote, there was another one Adam made about bands not being a thing anymore, a rough performance in Chile with Adam acting very rude to the crowd, the recent tabloid news about Adam, 
Wow, these all have to do with Adam, don't they? In fact, allow me to make a statement that should be no surprise. When people hate on Maroon 5, they're really just hating on Adam Levine. It's the monkey's paw unfurling from the success of moves like Jagger and the individualization of Adam Levine. When's the last time any Maroon 5 member that wasn't Adam did something worthy of hate? Bad question, never mind. This leads into reason number one why I think Maroon 5 is still around. They are really good at being scapegoats. In a world where stan culture dominates, I think Maroon 5's value to some is just being a guilt-free punching bag. Like, imagine directing the same level of hate for Maroon 5 towards anyone else. You hate on Kendrick or Beyonce, you risk coming off as ignorant or even racist. You hate on Taylor Swift, you open yourself up to destructively targeted mockery not felt since middle school. You hate on BTS and you you die! You hate on Maroon 5. I mean, you might get a few people mad, but you're not getting doxxed over it. Sometimes people just need to hate on something, and Maroon 5 is a pretty safe target. And I mean, we all know now that you can make a career off of being hated in the age of the internet, right? Like, we've all seen it happen enough times now, right? Please tell me we all get this. The second reason, Maroon 5 have been at it for long enough to establish themselves as a recognizable brand. Not only does that mean they've claimed a stable stake in popular culture, for better or worse, but remember what I said earlier about radio airplay, which is, believe it or not, still a big player in music. Maroon 5 hits are consistent enough in the right places that A, people can invest knowing they'll earn it back and then some, and B, other artists can use them to boost their profile. Sure, no one's gonna make their career off a of Maroon 5 verse, but if hearing Megan's verse on Beautiful Mistakes gets someone to check out Traumazine, then I think that's a win. The final reason, and this one might piss you off, is that people still actually like Maroon 5. Throughout this video, I've found good from each album. Not every album in total is a winner, for sure, and not much will blow your mind if you're a nerd for music like me, but there are still songs to enjoy, and plenty of people seem to agree. The chart placements, the tour revenue, all of that has to be coming from someone, the silent majority, if you will. So maybe that's it. Lots of people still like the band, the world is bigger than the loudest voices on the internet, and there is usually good to be found even in bad bands. Cheers to the ones that we got. Cheers to the wish you were here, but you're not. Maroon 5 will soon be wrapping up their 2020 tour in Asia. Then next year, they'll be kicking off a Las Vegas residency. For Adam Levine, though, the news as of late has been very unfortunate. Adam was caught in 1080 by 1920, soliciting a year-long affair with an Instagram model. <gasps> Who could have seen this coming? cheating on his girlfriend, cheats on Kira Knightley, kissing a girl at a party, cheating on Alexandra Daddario. For real though, that's crummy behavior and I feel bad for his wife and kid. I hope he is able to see the error of his ways and I send as many well wishes to him and his wife as I can muster, considering they are two people whom I've never met and their personal relationship has no tangible impact on my life. I'd like to end this dive with a prediction, if you will, and I'm gonna need help from someone. Hi, I'm Garth Brooks. Hi, Garth. This is Garth Brooks. He was a massive country star throughout the 1990s. Everything he produced, songs, albums, concert tours, was lucrative to an unprecedented level. By some metrics, he is the most successful recording artist in US history. When's the last time you heard his music? When's the last time you heard it played in a supermarket or out in public? When's the last time a song of his became an internet meme? When is the last time any of his music has made any kind of impact outside of the 1990s? Now, some of that lack of continued relevance is by choice. For example, did you know Garth kept his music off streaming for years and today it is only available on Amazon Music? And of course, I'm sure some of you may be going down to comment the songs you've enjoyed and still enjoy by Garth, but there's this inexplicable phenomenon where Garth was shattering records for a decade straight and then just disappeared. I bring this up because as time goes on, I think two things will happen to Maroon 5 as it pertains to their catalog. Everything up to moves like Jagger will still be fondly remembered if contained to its time period. The same way we think about all of those mid-2000s rock-adjacent acts. Everything post-Jagger will still get played here and there, but come that day when Maroon 5 call it quits and retire, I think it's gonna mostly disappear, just like Garth's music. Remembered faintly by those who were there, loved by a good handful, but nearly forgotten by all future generations. If you wanna get into Maroon 5, check out the first three albums. As for the band post moves like Jagger, 
I don't know, I wouldn't really recommend any of the albums in full. I would say just check out the songs that I've mentioned in this video, which are in a playlist that's linked in the description. And if you have a favorite Maroon 5 song, album, related thing, I would love to know what it is in the comments.